Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. We are with Oleksiy Danilov, head of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, one of the key institutions coordinating Ukraine's resistance to Russian aggression. Mr. Danilov, thank you very much for being with us. We're meeting at a time when Ukraine is saying it urgently needs more weapons from its Western allies to defend against possible new Russian attacks in the early spring and to mount its own counteroffensives. And I'd like to start by asking you, do you think that things are changing in the level of Western support for Ukraine? We've shown that all the intelligence services, including the French, were mistaken when they predicted that Russia could defeat us within three, five, seven days. We showed everyone that that's not possible, that that won't happen. After that, countries started to help us a bit. Now the myth of the world's second greatest army has vanished like the morning fog. The number of countries that is helping us grows with every week. How do you see the situation evolving in the coming weeks and months? It will be difficult. The thing is that Putin and his clique now think that they cannot lose and don't want to admit their errors and mistakes. And of course, they'll try to do everything they can to change the course of this war. We understand what they're preparing for. We're also preparing our resistance. We understand where they are going to most want to attack, and we are preparing for those things. I can say for sure that this war will be resolved on the battlefield. Could I ask you to describe to us how you could imagine the best case scenario going forward, and then also the worst case scenario? You mean for ending the war? Well, victory for us means a return to our country's 1991 borders. We don't need anyone else's territory, and we won't give ours to anyone else. We don't think about any worse scenarios. We are going to fight, and we'll do everything in our power to ensure that we get our territory back as per the 1991 borders. All the other ideas that are starting to be thrown out there by various countries about the need to give Putin some kind of guarantees to make an agreement with him, to not provoke them, are absolutely unacceptable to us. If they had started giving us large quantities of weapons back in March, I think this would all be over already. The quicker we get help, the quicker we can solve this problem. I repeat, if someone thinks they can reach an agreement with Putin's fascist regime, that is just not realistic in any way. I can give you an example from recent history. In 2008, when there was the situation in Georgia, the French president took part in talks between the Georgian leader and Putin. They reached an agreement, and Putin did not adhere to a single word of what was agreed. You can't make agreements with someone who does not keep their word. I was thinking also of the timing. In terms of the time frame, it depends on the deliveries of weapons and a lot of other factors. The question of when the process of the collapse and disintegration of Russia starts is only a matter of time, of a short time in historical terms. And that's not our fault. The collapse of Russia is the work of Putin, the result of everything that he's been doing in that country over the past 23 years will be the disintegration of the Russian Federation. He is the ruiner of the Russian Federation. Even great countries cannot impose their conditions on the territory of other countries. Take the United States of America. When they left Vietnam, they had understood that they could not in any way defeat the Vietnamese militarily. They had the decency to leave. Russia now must do the same. The sooner Russia leaves Ukraine, the better its chances of surviving in a more or less agreeable form. My impression is that some in the West, perhaps cynically, um, privately anyway, may think perhaps better a long war in Ukraine going on and on rather than Putin panicking and using nuclear weapons. What would be your response to that? Of course such views exist, and there are such countries. 
and such groups among political leaders that believe that is the way to go. They have the right to that opinion. But one should not be afraid of Putin. When you start to be afraid and fear gets you inside, you're losing. You lose if you fall into fear and panic. Scaring countries with nuclear weapons is simply unacceptable. But Putin is just not the kind of person one needs to be afraid of. He'll never press the nuclear button. He's simply a coward. Why are you so sure of that? Look, before the war, a large number of representatives of foreign intelligence services met me in this very room to talk about the developing situation, and they were all sure that we would lose. I explained to them that that's not possible. I told them we understand the Russians very well, how they are going to think and behave in a given situation. And if Putin, heaven forbid, were to take such a decision, that's the end of Russia within half an hour. Russia would cease to exist. It wouldn't even be necessary to fire a nuclear weapon in return. They would simply be destroyed. And all sensible people in Russia understand this. Putin will not press the nuclear button. He will not. Kirill, uh, the patriarch, he says uh, defeat of Russia would be the end of the world. Somebody else in Russia had said uh, better nobody exists uh, than that uh, Russia ceased to exist. Uh, just like, uh, you know, the Nazis at the end of World War II when they committed suicide. You don't think this is possible? Did Hitler press the nuclear button? No. He didn't have nuclear weapons. Nebulo. Even if he had, they would never have let him. Listen, they won't let Putin press the nuclear button. They just won't. Bear that in mind. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the state of the Russian army is such that the explosion that they may want to cause might happen right there where they are. We see with the rockets that they keep firing towards our territory. Some of them land on Russian territory. They keep it quiet, but we know about it. Volgograd region, Saratov region, Kursk region. Uh, this is another question I wanted to ask uh, about explosions in Russia. Do you think that Ukraine should be firing at targets in Russia? And are Ukraine's Western allies still trying to discourage you from doing that? We are not waging war on Russian territory. Crimea is our territory and we will fight for it. Donetsk and Luhansk regions are our territory and we fight for them. Full stop. But if in Belgorod region in Russia they station weapons that are killing our children, we have to destroy those weapons. Let them just remove the weapons that are killing our children from there, and we'll stop. You mentioned Luhansk. That's where you're from, I believe. I wanted to ask, are you in touch with anyone there? Yes, I'm from Luhansk. They don't like to mention that. I was mayor of Luhansk. I was governor of the region. The Russians think that all the people living in Luhansk region should be considered Russians. Yes, I'm from Luhansk, and that doesn't stop me being a Ukrainian patriot. There are plenty like me still there, who are helping us on our way to victory. What most surprised you or impressed you in the course of these 11 months of war? I wasn't really surprised or impressed. I received confirmation of the greatness of our people. I was already confident. And after the 24th of February, that confidence rose to the highest possible level. Not long ago, you wrote in a blog post, in the new world, a terrorist state can be removed from the UN Security Council and stripped of its nuclear weapons. But how exactly do you think this can be done? <coughs> there is nothing impossible in this world. 
the world should understand that if a country is a terrorist, it has no place on the United Nations Security Council, at least for the duration of... Look, what should have been done? In my view, as soon as the war started on the 24th of February, Russia should have been suspended from the Security Council, at least for the duration of the war. That would have been absolutely fair. Instead of covering our eyes and pretending nothing's happening, and let's keep living according to... Look, Putin does not abide by the rules. He doesn't respect any international agreements. The world really wants to live with him according to the rules, but it doesn't work. If you sit down to play chess, there are some rules. How the knight moves, how the pawn moves, and so on. You sit with him to play chess, and he just sweeps his arm across the board and says, look, I win. That's how it looks today. President Zelensky said he wants to go to the United Nations at the time of the anniversary. Is that to ask for Russia to be removed from the Security Council? All civilized countries of the world should be asking for that, if we're talking about civilized countries. If we're talking about countries that only care about money, what can they earn from Russian resources? Well, then tell that to the world. That democracy, freedom, a rules-based international community, that they're absolutely irrelevant. And we live by some other rules. We have to choose. Either we're building a democratic world, a free world where individuals are the key elements of democracy, or we're supporting terrorists who may decide at any moment to destroy some country or other and just say, that's how we like it. Alexei Danilov, thank you very much for being our guest. And thank you for watching. Stay tuned to France 24 for more news.